Hi there, I'm Pamela Ambler. Welcome to I See Your Trade, the show that looks ahead with fresh insights and data-driven deep dives. The world's geopolitical balance is starting to wobble. Russia is still at war with Ukraine. China and the U.S. are now trading verbal blows over Taiwan, in addition to China imposing sanctions on Australian goods. But with volatility comes opportunity. I'll be joined by our guest, Chris Verone, head of technical and macro research from Strategus Research Partners, who's joining me from New York. Now let's start by looking at why the world is on edge. Just as most of the world started to emerge from the mass lockdowns of the global pandemic, Russia invaded Ukraine. Markets weren't too worried about the war at first, but the sanctions imposed on Russia by the United States, the G7 and the EU had an immediate impact. We're banning all imports of Russian oil and gas. To hold accountable Russian oligarchs who seek to evade U.S. sanctions. And the ripples started to spread around the world. Russia is the world's largest exporter of wheat. It's the third biggest producer of oil, the world's second largest producer of natural gas, and the largest supplier of gas to neighboring Europe. Russia's invasion of Ukraine sent energy and food prices soaring, all while the global economy was only just beginning to recover from the trade disruptions caused by the pandemic. The war in Ukraine brought the gas crisis to a new level with the price of nat gas surging 700% in Europe. Natural gas now rivals oil as the fuel that shapes geopolitics. And there simply isn't enough of it to go around. Germany is warning that shortfalls could trigger a Lehman Brothers-like collapse. Higher gas prices are pushing up the cost of electricity, which is contributing to rampant inflation across the world. The Russian war with Ukraine has also been the perfect smokescreen to embolden China. China has warned the U.S. president not to play with fire over the country's recent dialogues with Taiwan. The U.S. and China are also facing a battle over America's decision to make semiconductor chips at home. It seems to me our responsibility as leaders of China and the United States to ensure that the competition between our countries does not veer into conflict, whether intended or unintended. It's simple, straightforward competition. Meanwhile, Australia-China relations are at a multi-decade low, with China imposing trade sanctions on Australian exports, including wine and lobsters. While all this was happening, Israel ramped up its never-ending battle with Palestine. As countries effectively close ranks and shut their borders, deglobalization is boosting foreign exchange volatility. The VIX volatility index has been fluctuating between volatile and highly volatile all year. But in times of crisis, the risk is high, but so is the return. It was all coming up roses in 2021. The world started to emerge from COVID. The global economy roared back to life with the strongest growth since the 1970s. And then 2022 hit and everything started to go pear-shaped. I'm joined now by Christopher Verone, head of technical analysis, Strategus Research Partners. Chris, thank you very much for joining us today from New York. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Obviously, we know uh, Russia's war with Ukraine is a major factor for the economic pullback we've been experiencing. But is it more than just that? Our country is becoming more protectionist. Yeah, you know, I think the seeds of this crisis were planted long before Russia invaded Ukraine. I think you know, this was preceded by an energy crisis. And, you know, something we always say in our work and to our clients is you know, geopolitical events really don't change what's going on. They serve to exacerbate or accelerate what was already happening. I think you see that with the energy crisis. I mean, uh, oil was going up long before Russia invaded Ukraine. Commodities were in a bull market long before uh, that event. The energy stocks were your leadership uh, long before as well. So I'm not sure I would think about the geopolitical events of 2022 necessarily as changing the dynamic very much. I would think about them more as accelerating what was already going on. You know, not dissimilar from the appropriate way we thought to view COVID back in early 2020. COVID didn't change a lot of the leadership. It accelerated what was already going on. So a similar framework we're applying to the lessons of today. 
And now the global gas shortage is really beginning yeah. to bite. It's not as much of an issue at the moment, but Europe is heading into winter and the conflict is still ongoing. What's going to happen there? Yeah, I think it's a bad recipe for risk assets in Europe as we kind of enter the final months of the year here. Um, certainly, I think it's been reflected in the bear markets you've seen in the equities. Um, it's one of the reasons we continue to like energy and gas stocks uh, going forward. I think it speaks to the weakness we're seeing in the currency um, uh, across the continent. I think it speaks to what we've seen in bond yields. You know, as we speak this morning, you know, UK bond yields are making new highs and German bond yields are back up. So. I I think it's a very, very um, difficult cocktail or very difficult mix uh, for Europe to come out of this and avoid recession or avoid the continuation of this bear market. I'm just going to shift to uh, looking at global supply chains. They're still recovering from the pandemic, but one of the world's busiest shipping lanes sits right between Taiwan and China, and almost half of the world's container ships and 88% of the world's largest ships by tonnage have pass through the narrow Taiwan Strait this year, and that's according to data from Bloomberg. Could the Taiwan Strait be the new flashpoint for geopolitical conflict? Well, it certainly seems that way, and that was on display, I suppose, last week as the Speaker of the House um, made her way uh, over there. And I, I think certainly as investors, we need to be very mindful of what the geopolitical hotspots uh, are, but we also have to be respectful that sometimes the markets just don't care as much. And I think as the market has rallied uh, over the last month or two, it has put some of the geopolitical stuff, particularly from China, perhaps into the rear view for now. That doesn't mean it's going away permanently. And you know, this is where I think looking at the, the groups and the sectors and the stocks that are specifically impacted did by some of these geopolitical events is going to be really helpful. And you know, one thing we've noticed, even as the market rallied, the defense contractors, the, the Lockheed Martins and the Raytheons and the Northrop Grumman's have continued to actually act well. So I don't think the defense stocks are all in on this idea that the geopolitical conflicts are moving to the rear view. I think their leadership suggests, hey, this might be with us for a while. Yes, you mentioned a defense sector, but also we know with volatility comes opportunity. What asset classes and sectors are the beneficiaries of uh, the global gas crisis? Well, I think the obvious place to look is the commodity and the energy basic material stocks. We've been very bullish on energy really for the better part of the last two years. So I think what's notable about that call is it predates a lot of these geopolitical events that have kind of come about uh, over the last 18 months. I think ultimately we like energy because it's just too small of a share of the S&P given the energy crisis that the, that the world find itself in. Right now, energy is still only about 4% of the total weight of the S&P. The long-term average is closer to 12. That's where we think we're going. So this sell-off in energy stocks, I do think is an opportunity to take advantage of this longer-term trend. And how are you playing this gas crisis? Is it equities like shale gas developers yeah. or perhaps commodities futures, or is there a currency angle to this? Where's the smart money going? Well, I think it's a great question. I think there are two ways to kind of go about this. On the equity side, it is owning the more gas-centric names. You've seen uh, oil and gas services, clearly a leader, oil and gas exploration, clearly a leader. But I also think there's a currency side to this as well that you bring up. And, you know, those countries are parts of the world that are very dependent on energy imports. We've been very bearish on their currencies. Japan stands out. I mean, we've seen pronounced weakness in Japanese yen uh, this year. I think that is certainly a reflective of being a commodity importer. And then lastly, I think the euro uh, is reflective of this as well. In addition to the other issues that the eurozone currently find itself in, I think the energy crisis is a very, very meaningful way uh, on the currency. You know, as we sit here today, euro USD is back to 101, so you're almost at parity here again uh, on euro dollar. We like euro lower. We don't think the street is as bearish on euro as they need to be, given the set of circumstances that the continent currently find itself in. There's also the other layer of uh, central bank policies playing a role in that yeah. currency fluctuations we're seeing. But um, about the emerging crisis in the Taiwan Strait, where do you see the opportunity there? I think what we're looking for in our work is looking for companies and groups that have already started the process of moving businesses and operations 
away from that part of the world. I, I think it's a reason if you look over the last couple of years, places like India have been an outperformer relative to China, or we've seen Vietnam be an outperformer relative to China. So it's not a complete abandonment uh, of Asia. It's just realigning, I, I think, where the country or geographic leadership uh, is found. And along with that, how do you see the U.S. President uh, Biden's move signing the CHIPS Act to boost U.S. Yeah. chipmakers to compete with China? How do you take advantage of this shift in manufacturing? Well, I think what's notable about this CHIPS Act is, you know, you tend to get big legislation or uh, big policy actually after the immediacy of the crisis has passed. And, you know, I think when we look at the CHIPS bill, it was really designed, number one, to bring production uh, back home, but number two, to alleviate um, uh, this, this idea of chip shortage that has been so prevalent. But what we find interesting is that the semiconductors actually peaked, the stocks peaked six months ago and the relative performance of the semis peaked uh, about six months ago here as well. So I wonder, are we actually walking into a glut of chips? You know, we've heard so many anecdotal stories of um, companies uh, ordering and double ordering or triple ordering chips and then canceling when they get the ones they need. So, you know, it, it, isn't that the type of dynamic that you see as you're beginning to walk into a recession. So I think the underperformance of the semis, the weakness um, uh, in the chips is reflective of a coming glut, uh, too much inventory uh, on the chip side. We've moved from having not enough uh, semiconductors and really addressing that being the big issue to all of a sudden now we're talking about a slowdown in chip yeah. manufacturing or, or, or a slowdown in demand rather. Now with um, every geopolitical flashpoint uh, coming back to that, there's generally warning signs and the obvious one <laughs> is currency which we touched on but are there any other market indicators that traders should be watching? Well, I'd really highlight three things. I would say number one, as you touch on, I think currencies can give you an early look of when volatility is gonna permeate into other markets. The weakness in the Euro is a year old. The weakness uh, that we've seen in dollar yen um, certainly as well. What I would focus on right now though, is the weakness we're seeing in the Chinese yuan. I mean, this is a very, very big move in Chinese yuan uh, uh, over the last several days. We like yuan to continue to weaken from here. And it's been our experience, anytime Chinese yuan weakens, you know, what goes up globally is volatility. So I'd say that's number one. I'd say secondly, you know, look at the performance of these defense contractors, right? If we're in some pr uh, protracted geopolitical conflict, I would expect the defense contractors would outperform. They have been, I would expect uh, that to continue here. And then lastly, I mean, this to us is really all stemming from an energy crisis. So I think natural gas, I think crude, I think the performance of energy, uh, I think the performance of the energy stocks is gonna be very telling in kind of where we are on the arc of this geopolitical event. And we're currently in this sort of investing in a crisis mode. It's high mm. risk, high reward. Uh, there's a lot of buzz around the big short investor, Michael Burry, where he made a personal profit of $100 million by shorting the US subprime market ahead of Lehman's collapse. He's got some new moves now. Um, and do you know of any of these trades happening now? And what are they? Well, I think the big question that we need to ask ourselves is, you know, it's been a, a, a bad first half of 2022. I think at the lows, S&P was down over 20%, NASDAQ was down closer to 30. And over the last six, seven, eight weeks, we've made a lot of that ground up. I mean, S&P has rallied sharply, NASDAQ has rallied sharply. So the question we're asking, are these rallies the real thing? Has a new bull market began or are these rallies where you want to take some risk uh, off the table? It's possible the truth lies somewhere in between. We do find ourselves still more cautious here. I think in particular, what I would be skeptical of, just given how sticky bond yields have been, I would be skeptical of these big growth stocks. Um, you know, you've had big rallies in NASDAQ type names over the last number of weeks. I think so long as bond yields remain as sticky as they are, and that's globally. I mean, you have UK two-year yields at new highs today. US two-year yields are right there as well. I think you wanna be very skeptical of uh, some of the growth issues. And obviously in times of crisis, the instinct of trader, traders is to sell. Is now a good time to offload or just to hold on and ride out the current volatility? Yeah, you know, I think um, 
you know, when you consider where some of the best market bottoms have been formed, it's often against the backdrop of great uncertainty. I think the difference is where we are in the economic cycle right here. I mean, we still have a Fed that is uh, tightening. We still have a yield curve that's deeply inverted. So it would be historically unusual to start some new bull market against that backdrop of circumstance. Thanks, Chris, for that. And now we're going to dive into the data. And because we are on a vodcast, you can see the charts that we're going to talk about. So if you're listening via audio only, we encourage you to turn on the screen now so that you can see the charts. But for our listeners, we will also talk you through the data. Let's jump right in. So this first chart, it shows some of the headwinds confronting Europe right now. What are they? Yeah, you know, I think when I look at something like the German DAX, right, this has really been at the forefront of some of the weakness we've seen in 2022. And, you know, Germany in general is kind of getting it from both sides. You know, it's a very Chinese dependent economy. We've had a severe slowdown in China. And on the other hand, uh, we have the energy crisis that has plagued most of Europe. So, you know, Germany has really um, uh, been at the cross current of these two headwinds. It's one of the reasons that we're still quite negative on German DAX. least in relative terms. You know, if you look at the relative performance of Europe versus S&P, that has continued uh, to make new lows here. So I am skeptical of Europe here. I think the combination of energy crisis and China slowdown uh, is a pretty big hurdle. And this, the dual crisis, the energy crisis and this weak China we're seeing, how is that impacting the euro? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, one of the things that's been really telling to us over the last several weeks is as the equity market has rallied uh, off its mid-June lows, we really haven't seen Euro USD rally to any meaningful degree. Um, we got to about parity. We trade at 101, 102 today. So you have not had a meaningful move in Euro. I think this is uh, ultimately going lower. If you look at things like Italian and German spreads, they're still under uh, some pretty uh, intense stress here. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, I don't think we've seen the clearing price in Euro USD yet. I would also just note, remember, if you go back to 2011, 2012, which was the European banking crisis and the European debt crisis, it was really quantitative easing that bailed Europe out. So we're in a very different monetary framework today. So I'm not sure you, that, that you're ultimately going to get the type of support uh, from central banks around the world uh, to really support Euro here. Well, speaking of central bank support, let's move over to China, where there was a surprise rate cut. What are the charts telling us about the weakness of the Chinese economy? Well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, from the context of it being a surprise rate cut, I'm, I'm not sure we should be that surprised given the magnitude of the slowdown, given the weakness that we've seen in credit. And you know, that's really what I'm trying to show you here with this slide. Uh, ch- the Chinese high yield index has remained under pressure the um, uh, the entire time. And we've seen the, the rally in Chinese equities really start to deteriorate uh, over the last several weeks uh, here as well. I think when you take a step back and kind of put this um, into the bigger picture, uh, the, maybe the most important thing going on in the world right now is the weakness in Chinese yuan. I, 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 I don't think they have any other choice but to, but to continue to weaken the currency here. It's a little bit reminiscent of summer of 2015 or, or mid-2019, where you saw this you know, big weakness in uh, Chinese yuan that contributed to a lot of volatility globally. So I think that's certainly important here. And the other thing I would just observe about China as they cut rates this week, bond yields still fell. Now that sounds logical, but if you're getting to the other side of a crisis and you cut rates, bond yields should actually rally. So I think the action from the bond market, the action from the currency market, and the action from the equities suggest the crisis in China is ongoing. It's ongoing, and as a matter of fact, there are more rate cuts expected, because 10 basis Mm -hmm. points is not that much, Um, so possibly more uh, with, with China not wanting to uh, see too much of, of their capital outflow, right? Um, and with everything going on right now, where do you see opportunities specific be- specifically between uh, the technology sector versus the energy sector? Yeah, you know, I think this, this ratio or this pair that we look at, um, tech versus energy, is so emblematic of the environment that we find ourselves in here. I mean, tech has largely been leadership compared to energy for the last decade. That has started to change 
over the last 12 months. And I think just given the realities of energy crisis around the world, I am much more inclined to be a seller of tech here and a buyer of energy. We've seen energy correct. I think it's timely, it's oversold. And conversely, we've seen energy, uh, we've seen tech rally. And I think tech is overbought, but in a downtrend. And those aren't really the combinations that we like. So I'm a buyer of energy here, I'm a seller of tech. I think that relationship or that ratio is gonna give us a lot of clues about what the future uh, may look like. And how is the world's largest economy tracking so far? Any indications from the S&P 500? Yeah, it's a great question. And we always say in our work that the market is the best economist that we know. And you know, certainly this rally over the last two months uh, has been intense. I mean, S&P, I think, is up 16 or 17 percent off the lows. We're right back to the 200-day moving average. But what really ends a bear market when the slope of the 200-day moving average starts to turn back up. And you know, we don't have that here yet. So we're into some resistance. I think we ought to be a little bit careful here. It's the middle of August. It's typically not a great time of year to be putting on risk. And I'm just frankly not convinced the market is sure which way the economy is going to break. I think the bond market is suggestive that the Fed is not done here. And if we're still in a tightening cycle, I would be skeptical putting too much risk on. And looking at the S&P versus bonds, could the U.S. market be on the verge of a comeback, a sustained one? Well, it's a great question, and I think the yield curve is often so telling in getting an understanding of where we are in both the market and the economic cycle. And you know, one of the things that we just can't reconcile is your major uh, market lows, your major economic lows have almost always been associated with a steepening curve, right? The yield curve is almost always positively sloped by the time the equity market bottoms. That is not the case here. I mean, twos and tens are still inverted by upwards of 45 or 50 basis points. Um, so we haven't seen the type of steepening that typically precedes a major market low. So it leads us to the conclusion that this is still a late cycle environment. And as markets rally into resistance, you actually want to take money off the table or take profits uh, because the economic cycle has just not turned yet. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for your insights. That was Chris Verone, Head of Technical and Macro Research, Strategus Research Partners. Thank you. What an insightful conversation. There's no doubt that with volatility comes opportunity. You've been listening to episode three of I See Your Trade. I See Your Trade is brought to you by IC Markets, a leading high performance trading provider. Trade out to IC Markets. In our next episode, banking on Bitcoin, will it become the world's reserve currency? Thank you for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you next time.